All right, so this lecture video is going to go over how what we can tell about an element's charge and its behavior due to charge just by looking at the periodic table. So get your handy dandy periodic table out because we're going to be writing on it, adding some more information that you you already added some last week, so we're just going to be adding some things to it. We know that all of these over here are metals and then over here are the nonmetals. correct? We learned that a couple weeks ago. So when we're looking at charges, elements are going to exist in a way that makes them stable, which really these are the noble gases, these are the most stable, okay? And these are like hashtag chemistry goals for all of the other elements. They want to be like this, these elements here which means that they want to have a full outer shell. So we can look at the periodic table and figure out exactly how elements are going to do that based on whether or not they give up or accept electrons in order to get to this particular goal, which is to be more like a noble gas. So when we look, remember, let's go reminder, we had group 1A here, this was group 2A, then we skipped over here. This was 3a, 4a, 5a, 6a, 7a, and then 8a were the noble gases. In group 1a, these, these elements are going to have a plus 1 charge to them. And the reason is, is that these electrons, so if you look here, they are going to readily give up one electron in order to be stable. If we grow up to group 2a, these are going to be plus 2 because they're readily going to give up two electrons in order to be stable. Group 3a will be plus 3. So all of these in group 1a, group 2a, and group 3a, oops, are going to give up electrons to become more positive. So for instance, again, let's look at lithium here. So lithium is always going to have a charge of plus one in its stable configuration. If you look at calcium, calcium will always have a charge of plus two. This is the situation that makes the element the most stable. Now we skip this row here the 4a row because they're going to be involved a lot more in covalent bonds without the charge. So we're going to come back over here and everything on this side now, let's change colors, is going to want to pick up electrons, which will make them more negative. So this in group 5a are going to have a negative 3 charge. In group 6a, a negative 1, 2 charge. And in group 7a, a negative 1 charge. So let's look at chlorine again. Chlorine, if you go figure out where it is on the periodic table, you know chlorine exists with the negative one charge. So just by looking at the elements on the periodic table, you can figure out what their charge will be. So let's go back to these. We skipped this whole section of trans transition metals, correct? That's because these have more than one option. So take iron for example. Iron can be plus 2 or it can exist in a plus 3 situation. So the transition metals are going to have more than one possibility for stability. We would write an iron with a plus 2 charge like that. You'd use a Roman numeral and that would, when you see that Roman numeral, numeral behind any of the transition metals, then you should know then that it's saying, okay, that means it's got a plus two charge. We would write iron with the plus three charge as iron Roman numeral three. So by just going down and looking at the periodic table, you can tell what element, what charge an element is going to have. Pretty slick, right? Now, the charge that an element has is really important when we start talking about how they bond with each other, with other elements, because we need compounds that are going to be electrically neutral. So if I have a plus one in one element, I need to make sure that the element that it's joining with has the same charge or that the charges even out. 
and that's going to mean sometimes playing with the numbers. So for instance, let's look at, we'll look at lithium again, and we'll look at oxygen, okay? If I have a lithium, and I have an oxygen, and they're going to combine, we know that lithium is plus one. We know that oxygen over here in group 6A is, plus, is minus two. So the problem is, is that these charges are not even. All right, we want them to be even. So what we have to do is we have to play with the number of elements in order to get them even. Well, I got a negative two right here. So I know that in order to get a positive two, I need to add two lithiums to that. And so now if I add these up, I have a plus one plus one because I have two lithiums, correct? So that gives me plus two, and then I have this negative two, and so now I have a electrically neutral element, compound, Li2O. There's two molecules of lithium, two atoms of lithium, because it's plus one, so that'll give me plus two, and one atom of oxygen. Let's say we do, let's just look at sodium chloride, sodium and chloride, right? We have sodium, sodium is a plus one, we have chloride, chloride is in group 7A, so that's a minus one. And look, it's electrically neutral, and so sodium is just one atom of sodium, one atom of chlorine. And we're gonna talk, the one of the lecture videos is about how you're gonna actually name these based on um, what element comes first and what element comes second. We'll do magnesium and phosphorus there, magnesium and phosphorus. And we know magne phosphorus over here has a negative three charge. Okay, so if we want to combine these two together, we need to figure out how to make this electrically neutral. Well, there's this slick little trick that you can use looking, kind of looking, going diagonal, right? If we put three atoms of magnesium, that's going to give us a total of, let's see, three times two is plus six, correct? And then diagonal again, two atoms of phosphorus, that would be two, phosphorus is negative three, so that would be negative three times two, which would give us negative six, and look, we have now have an electrically neutral atom. When you are writing chemical formulas, you need to make sure you're gonna add elements to make the compound electrically neutral, electrically neutral. Now, there are some situations in chemistry that are called polyatomic atoms. Poly meaning many, atomic meaning atoms, and it's basically an entire group that's going to have a positive or negative charge to them. So in the previous examples, we were looking at individual elements, but these are gonna be groups of elements that have a specific charge to it. So for instance, if you look here, here's a common list, and these are ones that you're just going to have to refer back to the table to know. But if you look at nitrate, let's look at nitrate here. Nitrate is NO3, okay, so it's one molecule of nitrogen, three molecules, or three atoms of oxygen, all right? And this whole structure here has a negative charge. So, you know, before, if we looked back at nitrogen up here, nitrogen had a negative three, and then we, you know, added what we needed to when there was, if we wanted to bond nitrogen with something else. But in this case, instead of dealing with just nitrogen, we're dealing with this whole group. And this whole group then has got a charge of negative three. And so when you see a chemical formula that's written where you have parentheses like this, you need to understand that the parentheses indicate that this group, this poly, more than one, atomic, more than one atoms, this whole group has a negative one charge. So instead of just necessarily looking at what the nitrogen and oxygen is, we're looking at the entire group, okay? Nitr or here's hydroxide, it's a common one. So when you see hydroxide written in a chemical formula, you know that the oxygen and the hydrogen combined have a negative one charge. And you would do these in a chemical formula just like you did the individual ones. So for instance, if I have OH on here, let's look back to my periodic table. Let's say I wanna do magnesium hydroxide. So we know that magnesium has a plus two. 
So let's go over here. So if I want to add magnesium to this, we know magnesium is a plus two. We know that this entire group is a negative one. So in order to balance this out, we would need two of these so that we would then have negative two in order to match the plus two on the magnesium. So the chemical formula for this would be magnesium OH2. Okay, so polyatomic item, polyatomic ions. If, if you take a more advanced chemistry class, you're gonna to need to memorize some of these, but you'll have the chart available to you for you to look. But just understand that these just mean that they're, the entire grouping has a charge. We're not looking just at the individual elements within that group. All right, last couple things is to look at some, looking at the periodic table again, what are some things that we can learn about elements and their ability to combine with other elements based on their position on the periodic table? So the first thing we're going to look at is electronegativity. Electronegativity refers to um, the tendency of an atom to attract electrons to it. So we're going to use electronegativity when we talk about covalent bonds because it's going to tell us where the between the two elements an electron will sit. Will it sit kind of in the middle or will it sit closer to one element than another that would make it a polar covalent bond versus a nonpolar covalent bond. So if you have a more electronegative element it will pull the electron closer to it. So if you look on your periodic table if we go across this way on the periodic table oh, electronegativity, it will increase from left to right, okay? So these elements are more electronegative than these elements, okay? So this is more. So it's going to pull electrons closer to it. Electronegativity decreases down, okay? So, so this one is going to be more electronegativity than this one. This one would have less ability or less tendency to attract elements. Next is ionization energy. Ionization energy refers to um, the energy that's required to actually remove an electron from its orbit. So ionization energy is going to decrease down a group because the electrons are located in shells farther away from the nucleus. There's more shells as you go down a group, right? So let's, there's more shells down this way. So ionization energy is going to decrease, okay? And it's going to increase from left to right. So again, on a quiz, I might say, okay, which one has a higher um, ionization energy, magnesium or phosphorus? And you should be able to look across and say, well, phosphorus has a higher ionization energy because it gets ionization energy increases as you go from left to right. If I said, which has a higher ionization energy, magnesium or barium, you would say, well, magnesium does because ionization energy decreases as you move down the periodic table. And that just has to do with how far away those outer electrons are from the nucleus. The, here, they're super close to the nucleus. So that positive negative attraction pulls those electrons really close to it and it makes it harder to pull it away. Here, they're a lot farther away from the nucleus. So that attraction or the need of the nucleus to hold on to that electron, remember the nucleus has all the positive charges to it, decreases. And the last thing, the last characteristic is the metallic character. And the ionization energy and metallic character are going to be used a lot when talking about ionic bonds. This is the ability of an element to lose an electron. Um, or in other words, how easily does an element give up its electron? So if you have a low metallic character, that means an electron easily gives up electrons. So that would mean that they would, are going to have a tendency then, right, to become more, to become cations, right? If they are giving up their electrons, they're going to become more positive. So again, you can look at the trend on the periodic table here, and as you move this way, okay, metallic character is going to decrease, right? So elements are going to lose electrons more easily. And as you go down this way, 
the metallic character is going to increase. Again, if I asked you on a quiz, well, which element is going to lose electrons more easily? You know, you would look across here. If I said between fluorine and beryllium, well, you would say beryllium is going to lose electrons more easily. And you should already know this, right? Because this is a plus one, this is a plus two, right? This is way over here, this is negative three, right? So just looking at the charges, you know that these elements here are going to lose electrons more readily than these elements over here. So add those pieces of information to your periodic table. Um, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. Hopefully, after this video, you understand how you can figure out what charge an element is, how you can use that charge to make a chemical formula, and then the different trends in terms of where ele electrons might be shared between elements and whether or not an element has a higher tendency to lose or gain electrons. Have a great day.